Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope you are filled with delicious tacos or barbecue after uh, Austin lunch. And thank you for joining us today on our panel about digital storytelling and brand building. And I'm thrilled to be joined by these three brilliant women today to dive into not just our stories, but some really valuable and actionable insights for you all um, to leave this room and start your practice of brand building and digital storytelling as well. But first, we're gonna do some very, very quick introductions. And along with those introductions, um, let's talk about what is your weirdest social media habit. Hi, I'm Snigda. I run a media tech company called The Juggernaut. We focus on telling South Asian stories. So stories about people originally from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, that entire region. We are the fastest growing demographic in the US and the world's largest diaspora. Um, and the reason I'm on this panel is because I still run our company's social media, uh, which is really funny. And I've grown it to about a quarter of a million followers. I think we hit 241K today. And my weirdest social media habit is that on the weekends, I turn off cellular data for all my social media apps so that I am not tempted to access them when I'm out and about and trying to be present for my friends. I'm Hitha Palapu. By day, I run a pharmaceutical company called Roshan Pharma. And on the side, I have been a longtime content creator, first a blogger, then an author, now on Instagram and a newsletter. And I run a series called Five Smart Reads, where I curate, and me and my team curate five stories you need to read every day, focused on underreported news and underestimated perspectives. My weird social media habit is I delete social media from my phone four days a week, um, delete it Thursday night, and I re-download it Tuesday morning. So. I too can be present with my loved ones and also just unplug from the world. Hello, I am Aparna Shawakramani. Some people know me as Aparna from Indian Matchmaking. That has become my new name since July 16, 2020. I was on seasons one and two of Netflix's um, Emmy-nominated Indian Matchmaking, and I'm currently an author. My memoir, She's Unlikable and Other Lies That Bring Women Down. I'm also in the process of writing my first screenplay. I actually just finished it, and um, I'm in late-stage development of my own docu-series. So I was an attorney for 10 years and have definitely made a career pivot. My weird social media habit is I set a timer for 20 minutes a day and I use that time to solely comment on people's um, posts in my feed. I want them to feel seen and heard. I don't put heart, heart, heart or smiley face. I actually make a meaningful comment about their post and that's really important for me to network and build and also feel connected to my community. She really actually does that. It's amazing and we love it. Thank you. My name is Upasna Gotham. I am a product and technology leader at CNN. Um, I work on building the content management platform that delivers breaking news to the world. Um, I'm also a board of directors member at the News Product Alliance um, and an amateur content creator, which we'll talk more about a little bit later, but um, mostly around elevating women in tech, especially in their careers and um, building wealth. And as you can see and just heard, we have a lot of crossover between our brands and a lot of multi-hyphenate passions. Um, and the first kind of topic we're gonna dive into is about brand definition. Where did we start? How did we get here? But not just about us. And so one thing we all discussed before we came here was we didn't want this to be story hour about our lives. We want this to be um, kind of like a masterclass for you all of uh, tips and actionable takeaways. So that, like I said, when you walk out of here, um, you have stuff you can implement immediately. So all of us have built brands professionally for our businesses, um, personally, and we'll start with Snigda, you know, how did it start with the juggernaut and how did you get to where you are now and how has the brand evolved over time? Um, I love this question because the first thing I always say when it's scary is that it is usually pretty bad in the beginning. Um, one of the questions I asked in the earlier room that we did is, can you raise your hand if you're in the session for your own personal brand? And then can you raise your hand if you're in the session for your company or another person? Yeah, so I, I, am, I am you. So it's really strange when you're an individual to start thinking like a company, right? 
And the, my biggest advice here is that your first few months are going to suck or maybe they currently do, but that's okay because so much of learning how to build a brand is through trial and error. So one of the things that I think about in the evolution of the Juggernauts brand is that when I want to be truly humbled, I go back to our early posts and I see how horrible they were, but I never delete them because they are a reminder of how your voice and how your style has evolved. And so that's one of the things I think about a ton. The second thing that we did a lot was how to make it super easy for us because we're so overwhelmed that, especially if you're working at a company, there's like 10 things on your plate any day. So one of the second things that we did was, okay, can we start being consistent? So we started posting at 12 and 6 p.m. So two posts a day on Instagram. Then we started thinking, well, what are the formats for each of those posts? So 12 p.m. is our new original article. We write articles like the New York Times. And 6 p.m. is a more upfront new story that can be fun. That's our 6 p.m. post. And before you know it, you're in a groove, right? And then the third piece I will say is that you will get haters, right? You will get haters as you're trying to tell your brand's story. Every company has faced a moment where they've done something terribly wrong. I think somebody just retweeted the other day that for Women's History Month, I believe Burger King once tweeted that women should belong in the kitchen. It was terrible for them. Like it was horrible. And I'm pretty sure people still eat at Burger King. I'm not saying you should do this, by the way. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that if you do mess up, if you made a mistake, the best thing to do is learn from it and apologize and move forward and keep listening to your community. But those are my three actionable tips, which is one, you know, just go for it. It's going to, maybe it's not great. Maybe you're not satisfied with your current story or brand building or storytelling that you're doing. That's okay. Just keep trying. Second, come up with a consistent process that works for you. A timetable, 12 PM, 6 PM formats, visuals, templates. And the third piece is you just can't care what other people really think about you in so much so that it prevents you from finding your company's or brands, voice, style, and authenticity, because you are going to mess up. Just accept that and imagine the worst, but just keep evolving. And pretty soon you'll see that you've created something you didn't realize you did. Hitha is, I mean, ever since you said the word multi-hyphenate, I have never resonated with something more than that in, in my life, because when it comes to even the juggernaut brand as a business or our personal brands, it's not one subject. We are not one subject, and businesses don't have to be either. So, Hitha, tell us about your multi-hyphenate brand. I mean, I'm just incapable of saying no, and multi-hyphenate sounds much better than that. So, I, um, I started a long time ago in 2009 as a blogger, and it was the same origin story as every other blogger. I had a very technical job, and I needed a creative outlet. Those early posts are terrible. And also the outfits I would wear and put on the internet for people thinking I looked good is comical. They're still there if you'd like to go see. My blog didn't really get traction until I started writing about the content that I wish existed. At the time I was traveling every week for work. I was never home and constantly unpacking, repacking. And these were either very formal business trips and as a younger woman with a sense of style, traveling with a lot of old men, I didn't know what I should wear, how to pack, what to pack. Once I started writing about that, that's really what took my had my blog take off. And I stumbled onto that niche, but I tripled down on it. So on the blog, I was writing packing posts and packing guides, as well as interviewing other people about their packing habits and offering just smart, servicey travel tips. That's how I got my first book deal, which is how to pack travel smart for any trip about four years after I was writing that kind of content with significant regularity. When I pivoted to Instagram and focused on Instagram and my newsletter, I created five smart reads because I wanted a new different kind of news content that was focused on the stories I wasn't necessarily seeing trending anytime I put on Twitter, clicked on Twitter, turned on the news, or went to the New York Times. That also that was a long, little bit longer traction to um, Snigda's point. That took probably months before people really started engaging, but then has grown where I have a team of contributors that I get to learn from and amplify, and now I'm in the process of figuring out how to build that into its own brand. And so my advice is whether you stumble on or you double down on a niche, consistency matters giving people a reason to come back to your account and engage with it every single day. That also works 
in how you want to produce that it's sustainable for you. So for me, Five Smart Reads is great because I don't have to be camera ready and talking into the camera. There's screenshots of news stories and my little commentary, which makes it very easy to stay consistent with. So I would say pick the content you wish existed, whether you're creating it or if you want to consume something specific, create it yourself if it doesn't exist. Figure out a cadence for you to be consistent with it. And also, I think with storytelling, don't focus so much on aesthetics. It doesn't need to look perfect. It doesn't need to look beautiful. If the content is really strong and good, it will resonate and focus on bringing together a conversation. Don't just be talking at people. Engage in your DMs. I think that is where you can get such great value, great feedback on what you're doing, and ask for feedback and be proactive about that. So what's interesting about the four people sitting up here is that we all started our career paths with doing what we were supposed to do. Um, and some of us, like Hitha and I, kind of integrated and expanded on our career paths and Snigda, Aparna especially, made pivots, you know, extreme pivots. So Aparna, please talk to us about your pivot and your brand. So before July 16, 2020, um, I had a private account on Instagram. It was like some nickname my friends had given me. And on the day the show came out, I changed it to my first name, last name, and I made it public. And I sat there and I waited. And um, what's interesting about Netflix is we don't get to see the shows before as talent um, before they come out. So I watched it when it dropped in L.A. at midnight, which was 2 a.m. in Houston. So I watched all five episodes I was in, and I had my first uh, interview uh, of my life, honestly, um, with The New Yorker <laughs> at 9 a.m. So I was like, okay, well, I don't even know how to do this interview because when I watched the show, I saw this woman on the screen. I saw her family. I saw her clothes. They all looked, you know, like me, but the story was the strangest story, and it wasn't the truth, and I was an absolute bitch. I mean, it was terrible. I was like, who is that lady on the screen? And sure enough, that's when the death threats started rolling in, the cyberbullying, Twitter was a rage. They wanted to know if we should kill Jessica Batten or Aparna first. I mean, this is pandemic, July of 2020. People were very bored and very angry. Um, <laughs> bored and angry. So I was like, look, I will never, ever, ever reach the 30, 40, 50 million people that Netflix reached. Um, and they told my story for me. And so now it was my turn to say, like, I'm going to tell my own story and I'm going to do it with the understanding that I will never reach 99% of the people that saw my story being told by someone else, but that doesn't matter. And what I did is I created my Instagram profile focused on that one account, really. Turned off Twitter because that place is mean. Never go to Reddit. That's a troll. Troll, like, headquarters. I don't know how those people even exist in the world. Um, and I was like, I'm going to try this. And what happened is that the, the press rallied around me. And I, I did over like 200 articles in the major newspapers around the world, media, media outlets. And um, it was all women journalists. I, I don't even think I had one guy in the 200. And they were all like, you got a bad edit. We're sick of the vilification of women. And that's when I got my book deal, She's Unlikable and Other Lies That Bring Women Down. And so you see on my social media page, I like tentatively start posting the articles I liked about myself. You can do that as a brand and as a personal brand. You can take other people's reviews of you or things about you and post it to your page. And I was like, no one's going to like this Oprah Magazine article on me. And it got like the most views and the most likes and the most shares. And so now I, I do that a lot. When I get a great article about me and I'm proud of it or it says something that I can't say myself, I amplify it. I take what they've given me and I take it to the next level. And I think that's like a big way that my brand has evolved. And it's the way that I can tell people what's going on in my life. I do get an influx of viewers of my page um, at certain points in my, like what's going on professionally. So when my book came out, there was like a million more people coming to my page every every month. When the show comes out, there's six million people coming to my page or nine million, you know. They're not going to follow me, but they're going to consume me. So then it's up to me to ask myself, how do I want them to consume me? So what I did after season two is this very like raw talking to the camera thing, which I was so freaked out about. But everyone had just watched the show and they wanted to see what I had to say about the show. And so I was like, oh, this is not my style, but 
I did it and it worked. Um, so always be looking at what your audience wants from you and who your audience is, because it might not just be the people that are following you. You might have something going on with your company or your brand that's bringing new eyes to you. You really use those times to really, really push your story and push it in ways that maybe make you uncomfortable, but make it very clear to those millions of eyes, hopefully millions of eyes, who you are and what you want to say. I think uh, to go along with that, it's serving your audience, and I like to look at it in the lens of how can I help somebody solve a problem. I started to get questions when I would randomly post things on Twitter and Instagram about, hey, I stumbled this way in my career and here's how it helped me. Um, or I wish I didn't make this mistake and you know, 10 years ago, here's what I would have done. Here are the tactical steps I took um, or I wish I would have took then to um, navigate that challenge. And when I started doing that, um, I started to resonate more with people. And I think that's the commonality we all have here too, is um, being in service of your audience, deeply understanding your audience, help them solve a problem. And going back to some of the comments, commentary here about, you know, like the cyberbullying, or you, you, you open yourself, you crack yourself open when you show up vulnerably like that. And one thing a mentor told me a few years ago when he encouraged me to start creating a personal brand or a professional brand is not everyone's gonna like you, but the right people will respect you. And those are the people that are gonna open up doors of opportunity for you that you never knew existed. And it's true, um, it has manifested in many ways in all of our lives for sure, but taking that step to show up is definitely something we're gonna talk about in a little more detail, detail later. Um, and it goes with building your network and it goes hand in hand with building, whether you want to call it a network or a peer group or um, a community, depending on if you're at a business level or a personal brand level, let's talk about the power of networking in the digital age where so much of our communication seems transactional. I didn't know any of these women until two years ago and it was all through social media. Actually, I'm meeting them all for the first time uh, today. Uh, in person. And so how did that how did that happen? It doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen um, randomly. it's in, it's very intentional. So thinking about your networks and your you know across business, personal pro and professional, um, how have you leveraged networking in your brands and how have you used it to you know elevate your brand or expand your communities? and how has that offered you? more opportunity. So going back to brand building as a brand or a company as well as a person, one of my biggest pieces of advice is to see who already is following your story because those are the people who are already your advocates or are open to a little bit more with you. And so one of the biggest things we started doing, it was such a tiny thing, was actually looking through who our follower lists were, especially when you're building a new brand from scratch, that's an easy list to follow, right? It might be 100, 500, 1,000, 2,000. Start following who those early adopters are and kind of notice who they are. That's kind of how we actually figured out that some really big celebrities were following the juggernaut. We found out that Purna Jagannathan of Never Have I Ever was following the juggernaut. We found out that Frida Pinto was following the juggernaut. Then as soon as I saw they were following them, and then I noticed they had become subscribers and paid us to read articles. And then that was the door opening for me to be like, hey, Porna, can I do a profile of you? Hey, Porna, do you want to come to New York and do a Q&A with our audience? Hey, Frida, can we do a Q&A with you? So basically take those moments and those small actions, like even if they feel like shadow actions of people following your brand, your company's brand, or you as an individual, to be an invitation for that opportunity, for that networking opportunity. For the juggernaut, you know, through both my personal <laughs> Twitter and the company Instagram, I've met some of our investors. I've met so many people who I never would have en envisioned they would have followed us or been interested in, in what I'm doing or that they even know who I am because my name is not on the juggernaut's Instagram. But if people are really dedicated to what you're doing, guess what? They'll figure it out. If you are, can you raise your hand if you're like a marketing manager? Okay, we have a lot of you folks here. Can you raise your hand if you're working in your brand in more of a business capacity? Okay, 
So we have some marketing managers, we have some business folks. What's really interesting is when campaigns work for brands, people will go to ends earth to figure out who did it. They will. Like some of those viral TikTok trends, I see Twitter threads all the time. Like who did this crazy viral thread with like this cat in front of like an auto shop? And people want to know who did it. And so that's my like biggest tip, which is you have these followers and these advocates just waiting for you to just take the next step. And the best brands I've seen take that next step because that is an invitation. So that's, that's my big tip. I, I, when I think of hit this network, I always think of like, you're the master connector, right? Like, you know how to connect people and you've built such an amazing community from, you know, aggregating really great news. It's coming from someone who is, works in news every single day. Like, that's how I found Hitha online. I was like, she is so mindfully and intentionally curating content for this audience who maybe doesn't see stuff, um, but wants to see it. So Hitha, tell us how networking you know, how you started from zero and got to where you are today and how it's helped you um, unlock more opportunity. You know, something Snigda and I share in common is we both did competitive speech and debate in high school. We did both competed in extemporaneous speaking where you had basically an hour to research, write, half an hour to research, write, and memorize a 10 minute speech about something in current events. That is where my news habit started, and it's kind of continued since I was 15 years old. So I've always been a very devoted news reader. I love knowing what's happening in the world, and I was kind of frustrated with outlets like The Skim that were designed for help women stay more informed, but spoke in a very, in a voice that I didn't resonate with and was aggregating and kind of synthesizing the news that a quick skim of the New York Times or Twitter would tell me what was happening. I said, what about the stories that aren't necessarily landing on the front page? What about deep dives in healthcare as I work in pharma? What about the women that are making the world a better place that I have to hunt and search for these articles for? I was already doing the work. This was my way of just sharing the goods. So it came from a very intentional and passionate place. But what was phenomenal about Five Smart Reads is it allowed me to start building net relationships with people. You know, the Oprah article that Upper Not referenced was the one that I had shared on Five Smart Reads. She DM'd me. We met, went for a walk in New York in Central Park in like the middle of the pandemic, and we've been friends since. Snigda and I met on a panel, and I invested a week later. Um, I think it is has helped me build my network in a really intentional and in a very earnest way. I genuinely love the news. I genuinely love reading stories that inspire and uplift and inform. And I really care to not just connect my audience to these stories and my community, but to in encourage conversation around it as well. I don't want it to be a one-way street. So I created what I wish existed, and I'm very grateful for it, and I'm very grateful to build it with others, and hopefully in time, I get to just take a step back and enjoy it some more. I also am someone who's been very lucky in my career. Both of my books, I was approached by my editors to write these very specific books, the one about packing that I mentioned, and it was because of Five Smart Reads that an editor from Hachette reached out to me to write a smart, serviceable book about the vice president-elect at the time, Kamala Harris. And if I hadn't invested in building my brand and building this content series, I think intentionally and authentically, people know when you're being played. People know when you're being fake. And there are times on social media where I said, I'm having a hard moment, so I'm gonna take a step back. See you soon. But I also don't use social media as therapy. So I think it's having boundaries. As I mentioned, deleting social media off my phone four days a week really helps because I don't use social media in a way I think a lot of other creators are finding their way on how do I be vulnerable and be honest and authentic, but also not overshare. I also know I'm not gonna be for everybody. So the takeaways I would take is whatever you do, do it with your full heart, and if you don't have your full heart to give, if it's a personal brand, don't do it. Figure out something else that resonates. Be able to create content consistently and show up consistently, and don't be afraid to slide into someone's DMs or to give them some love or amplify a story if you really do admire 
admire them because that's a way to build a relationship. And it's social media has truly changed and given me a career of my wildest dreams. I am so grateful for it. But I also know that there's a time and a place to be online and engaged. And there's a time and a place to go off and rest and recharge and spend time in the real world. I think with um, Aparna, I was very different overnight network and fan following that was built. Um, tell us how that has all changed and how you've leveraged the audience and community and fan following that you have um, to keep moving forward. I know in many ways I'm very lucky. I was very polarizing on that show, but the people that showed up like those journalists that were women, were other women who were in all industries and they were DMing me. I have to say, I don't think I've ever DMed anyone and slid into their DMs, but um, I'm gonna start. <laughs> I've learned a lot from these women. But as people approached me, I, you know, in that initial time period was also getting, I don't know, 15 to 20,000 DMs a week, maybe more, and I was missing a lot of them. So when you're on Instagram, what happens is that Instagram will prioritize people who are verified and they will put them at the top for you to see. Pay attention to things like that. Maybe you can't get to everybody. Maybe you're having a tough week. Maybe there's an influx for some reason. Your brand is doing something and, and you can't address everybody. Pay attention to the people that you can address in that moment and don't feel bad if you can't get to everyone. And so I really did connect with all those women and start relationships and with no purpose behind them. And I think that's really where I excelled in those relationships. I didn't want anything from them. They didn't want anything from me. They just liked me on the show. And so we really started friendships. And I think that often we close ourselves off from people in different industries or we think, oh, there's never a time in my life I'll intersect with them. Why should I give them time or energy? Because time and energy are finite for all of us. But if you are at a crossroads or if you are building in a way that you're not quite sure what the next step is, I would say focus more on time in your day, whatever time you have, on doing these, these meet and greets or these um, coffees or these FaceTimes or Zooms because those people can open up doors and ideas for you that you never had before. If I wasn't doing that, you know, even last year, Someone was like, oh, you know, someone I went to college with was like, I have to reach out to you. And I was like, what about? Like, we were never really friends in college. She's like, I have an idea for you. She works at Crown Media, which is Hallmark. And she's like, you need to write Hallmark movies. And I was like, I've never thought about writing a movie in my life. And sure enough, I just finished a screenplay and we're talking to Hallmark about it. I mean, the idea came out of nowhere. If I had said no to her reaching out, I would have never even come up with my next step. So always be open to the potential of who these people are and what they can you know, give you as far as ideas, even if they give you nothing else. It, they'll trigger something in you that's like, wait, that's my direction. It's worked for me. I love that. That reminds me of, so we all know, you know there's the state of the economy and the massive layoffs that have been happening, um, especially in tech. And one of the biggest regrets that I have heard from people who've been laid off is they wish they had built a stronger network to tap into after they got laid off. And goes back exactly or validates what Aparno is just saying is the best time to network is when you don't need anything, um, where it's just a genuine organic interaction. Um, I remember when I messaged Snigda, I don't know if you I don't know if you remember, but I do because you guys had redesigned the juggernaut. And I messaged her and I was like, this looks amazing. I just shared it with my product designers and my, and my product team. And we started following each other. And um, now we're here. <laughs> so it, it, again, when you don't need anything, sometimes the best relationships come, come from that place of just wanting to engage and um, enrich each other's lives. On that note, another question that I get often um, is how how to reach out and, you know, to a thought leader or a leader in their space um, or someone of power and influence and get a response, right? So love to help the audience today learn what are some tips that we have for people who are struggling to get responses or build meaningful connections, you know, on social media, um, given, you know, the transactional nature that it sometimes has. Um, yeah. What tips do you have? Yeah, um, I get to answer this from the brand perspective and partnerships, which is how do you go chase after that dream partnership? Um, when the juggernaut first started, we were this puny media tech company and 
all these other mainstream publications like think 538 or the New York Times have millions, if not tens of millions of followers on all their socials. And so one of the first things to think about what Upasna, Aparna, and Hitha have all been saying is how do you build a synergy where the sum is greater than all the parts? And so one of the things that happened was that I had met this person and he was a data scientist at 538, the, the company known for all of their political analyses. And he was also of South Asian descent. And I pitched him and I was like, hey, have you ever read anything on how South Asians donate to political campaigns? And he's like, no. And I'm like, can you figure out a way to measure that by parsing data? And he's like, yes. And soon enough, we had kicked off this collaboration where I think back in the day, the Juggernaut had maybe... 30,000 followers and 538 had a million, but they still worked with us because we had pitched them this really incredible story. Um, 538 brought their data chops and we then co-produced it and made sure we made sure that there were no mistakes on how they depicted South Asian Americans and they made sure there were no mistakes in terms of how the data was presented. And I think those partnerships happen at the end of the day because of people actually, it just goes back to people, which is you all probably know people at different companies through your LinkedIn's. So whenever you think of a dream kind of collaboration, just think really high, think aim really big, and then go through your own network on LinkedIn, on Twitter, wherever you are, and see who you might know at those companies. Go take them out for coffee, talk to them about what their biggest needs are, explain your goals, and try to see if something can happen. That's kind of how we've always punched above our weight, not because we think we deserve it or we think we're worthy. No, it's because we asked for it, number one. And number two, we try to give something so that their brand also felt that they were getting something out of that story. Um, So that's my advice on how to build some incredible brand partnerships. Even when you feel like you're tiny, even when you feel that there might not be something there, but you'll be surprised that, you know, a great negotiation, you can come up with a completely different solution that wasn't even evident in the beginning. Hitha? I'm a big fan of the cold handwritten note. It has served me very well in my career. There was one time where, you know, working in life sciences, I was almost always the only woman in the room, the youngest person in the room, and one of the few people of color in the room. One rare meeting, there was another youngish woman who happened to be the president of pharmaceutical services at Cardinal Health. She was wearing an ACDC shirt underneath her pantsuit, and I was like, I need to know everything about you, and I need to be your best friend. I wrote her a handwritten note after that meeting. We maybe had said five words to each other, but that was the way we built a relationship. And she's someone who has championed and supported me and to nominated me to join boards. I've given her insights on the world of building her own brand online and in digital health, and we are now close friends. But it started because I wrote that letter and sent it to her. It doesn't need to be a handwritten letter. It can be something as small as someone you admire having listened to them on a podcast or a news article, sliding into their DMs or trying to, I'm the big fan of trying to guess someone's email and the email client superhuman can kind of help you with that. So big fan of it is um, send them an email and say genuinely, I really enjoyed this interview. This point really spoke to me because, and be specific as to why a certain piece of advice or a certain story resonated with you. Always offer to follow up, like ask, be of help to them. And I really feel strongly in that if you are wanting to build a relationship with someone, you have questions for them to be of service in return and say, if there's anything I can do to help you, these are some areas I have some expertise, I would love to do that. And should this person take the time to write you back and offer you some advice or whatnot, make sure you close the loop and follow up with them to let them know what you did, whether you followed their advice or not, because then that builds their investment in you and helps build a relationship. I also start every single workday by reaching out to someone, either someone I admire or an old friend or colleague or acquaintance to just let them know I'm thinking of them. I hope they're well. I drop a few lines on what's going on in my life and I leave it open for them to respond. Some do, some don't but that is a way to keep that networking muscle warm and strong. And so it is a practice. It is like a habit, just like flossing, which I know we all should do, and some of us do and some of us don't, or drinking enough water. So make sure you build your networking muscle in any way that works for you. And I really am so careful to say, 
What works for me doesn't necessarily work for other people. So try a couple different things. Is it social media? Is it more on LinkedIn? Is it emails? Is it handwritten notes? Is it even, I mean, I'm not a fan of like the rogue phone call, but and I think most members of the millennial generation aren't, but do what works for you, what works for that person, and don't be afraid to reach out to someone that you might feel like you're punching above the weight because what's the worst that can happen? You don't get a response, that's okay. Power of the follow-up. Like, it's that. It's just doing that sets you apart from so many people. Um, the bar is not that high, guys. Like, people um, will reach out and ask amazing questions and then okay, I'll get back to you in a couple weeks or in a few days and I don't hear anything and, well, I'm not going to go run after you. You, I, you know, you reached out to me. I'm happy to, hear, happy to help and, and here to talk. Um, but that follow-up is how I have built the longer standing relationships with people who started as like my mentees, for example, and now we're very good friends. And you know, they're the type, they're the people that I refer to for jobs or speaking opportunities or help them with the salary negotiation or refer them for a certain, you know, podcast or publication. Um, it takes it takes time and building that intention and consistency and honesty also in those interactions is is so key. Um, Aparna, your DMs are probably always, not probably, they're always blowing up. So you've seen all sorts of interactions. What ones are the ones that stick with you when you're going through that list? Yeah. I spoke about a time when I really didn't know what my next steps were, and we will often get to crossroads like that in our careers, and our brands. Um, but once I did figure out, you know, hey, I'm going to start writing screenplays. Hey, I'm going to, you know, create my own docu series. I'm going to go deep in development. My time awarded to networking reduced. And for many of us, it will be very small at many times. And then you're starting to pick who do I want to, you know, who's inbound that's coming in, and how do I want to spend my time. And uh, what not to do is, hey, I'd like to pick your brain. Hey, I'd love to grab coffee. Hey, that idea you were talking about that dinner sounded so cool. I'm um, like, okay. Um, and so what I've started to say is, you know, can you please send me an email? You know, my time's pretty stretched right now with some projects I'm working on, but I'm happy to answer any direct questions you might have on my project or on my this or on anything that you need. Um, 90 to 95% of the time, they will not email you. And I'm like, huh, just got rid of them. Didn't even have to say no. <laughs> so if you are being protective over your time when you are, when people are trying to network with you, consider things like that. What are ways that you can give to them without giving away your time when you need it to preserve to do things for yourself, to create something yourself? Like I said, it is finite, and at times in your life you will be able to give more to your networking, and at times you will not. And it's just fair to also let people know that. And it's always a two-way street, right? I think we all touched on this in different ways, is when you're reaching out, what is it that you're bringing to the table also, right? Why should this person take their time to chat with you? Please don't say pick your brain. Like, we got to stop. We got to stop saying that. <laughs> there are better phrases. Uh, and again, finding a way, it's not like you have to give something material, right? It could be something as simple as showing gratitude or expressing your interest in some of their work. Have they, do they have a podcast? Do they have a book? Do they have a whole uh, publication, uh, the juggernaut, that you can reference something that they've done and talk about specifically what you liked about it? Um, there's also a big difference between like, wow, great article and great podcast or wow, this part really resonated with me. This part of your article really resonated me, with, with me. What you said in that speech at South By really resonated with me. Um, being specific and being honest about what you need is so key. Also, it comes to like, if you actually need something and want something, I love to connect people who are looking for jobs, especially in this, in this economy in tech, Please tell me that's what you're that that that's what you need, right? Not can I pick your brain? Not can we catch up? Um, and I don't I don't even know you, right? Say, hey, I found this job posting, and I saw you know this is on your team. Like, can we talk about it? Like, be specific because time is of the essence. Our energy and time is finite. So, 
kind of got to get to the point in those messages, but also express that gratitude. Um, going back to like our different platforms, I think, you know, Snigda being cross-platform with Juggernaut and doing it all herself, hit this newsletter, Instagram. Um, I found a lot of interesting content fun on Twitter, uh, uh, Aparna on, on TikTok and Instagram too. What's, with, l let's talk about some tactical tips across platform specific strategies, right? Um, Aparna, what about Juggernaut and across cross platforms? Like what have you seen work and not work? Um, ooh, so for, I think, yes, I know. <laughs> for the Juggernaut, I think what was really interesting, and Aparna has spoken about this as well, is when you are a company, a brand, a person, it is so intimidating to be on multiple channels at the same time. And if you look at every single company, I did this because I was an analyst at a venture capital firm at one point. Every single company has a super channel. This is the channel that they have the like exponentially amount of followers. We have 241,000 followers on Instagram. If anyone guesses right, how many followers do we have on Twitter without like looking at your phones? Someone said what? Four million, somebody said? A million? Okay, so close. So I will always, I'm a founder, I'm gonna say the highest number first. I talked about a quarter million followers on Instagram. Our followers on Twitter are 13,100. Tiny, because guess what? We haven't given it any oxygen, very few team resources. When you're a startup, you have to go like ham on like one thing. And we decided as a company, it was Instagram. Why? Most journalists typically say, go to Twitter. That's where journalism lives. That's where media tech lives. This is why you have to always challenge assumptions. And Upasana can talk about this as a product manager. But one of the things we realized is that what in the business of what we're doing, which is journalism about South Asian people, for so long, mainstream media had not covered us that the visual element was so critical to our storytelling. Seeing pictures of brown people doing things was so powerful for our brand. Seeing pictures of nostalgic old photos of Bollywood, old photos of Indo-Trinidadian, basically indentured labor, those were powerful visuals for our audience. And that's why, that's one of my hypotheses for why Instagram really worked for us. So once you see something working, double down. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of being bad at other channels. I was initially embarrassed our Twitter was bad. I tried to hire a consultant to run our Twitter, I spent a lot of money on it, and I realized it just wasn't moving the needle. Whereas like any extra hour I spent on Instagram was causing our viewership to go up. So my advice here is, as you guys are doing, as anyone is doing testing, it's okay to be bad at stuff. Right now, so many brands felt so much pressure to go onto TikTok, and Aparna will talk about that in a second. We felt that same pressure. All my investors were like, Snigda, have you guys heard about this company called TikTok? And funnily enough, um, my partner, he actually did venture capital in China, so he actually has known about TikTok for years. And no, I was not going onto TikTok because it was COVID, it was the pandemic, and I was exhausted. I was running a company single-handedly as a solo founder. So no, I did not go onto TikTok. Did I lose out on some audience? Maybe. Maybe you as a brand, you know, you're losing out on an audience. Maybe it's like, hey, I need to go hire a Gen Z intern. But my biggest advice is don't feel bad about doing one thing really well and letting something slide. Allow yourself that time and that grace, and maybe you'll get there and get it to it on your own terms. Our TikTok also really sucks. I think we have like four followers. Um, and that's okay. That's totally okay. I'll be that first person to tell you that. Um, and once you find something that works, just figure out the last tip here, figure out the easiest way you can cross promote it. So if we're going to spend a lot of time on Instagram and Instagram is going to prioritize reels, once we post that video on Instagram, we're sure as hell reposting it on TikTok and then reposting on YouTube shorts. Just make your life easy, but don't over index on something that you don't have the resources for. Love that. Um, can't be everywhere all the time, right? Um, Hitha, let's talk about newsletters because they're super hot in tech, especially right now, but in general, everyone starting one, present company included. And um, it's a wonderful way to show up differently and maybe expand on thoughts and stuff. So talk to us about how you start, well, you had a blog first, yes. then the newsletter. So talk to us about Five Smart Reads. The newsletter, so Five Smart Reads was born on Instagram first, and then I realized not everyone wants to be on Instagram first thing in the morning to consume their news. I certainly don't. So 
that was at the time Substack launched and made my life very easy to start a daily newsletter as well as a weekly digest as well. The Weekly Digest has significantly more followers, um, and it is where I get to be my most multi-hyphenated, aka random as hell, self, where I will talk about F1 fangirlification and Star Trek Picard and narratives in the same essay, and it engages with a different group of people than Instagram does. What I love about the newsletter is is mine. It is my, I can communicate with my audience, and it's a direct relationship that is not subject to the whims of a billionaire. So I appreciate being able to have something to drive people to from my Instagram to say, if you like what I'm sharing here, consider signing up for my newsletter and getting some different kind of content and a different peek into my life. And I find it's always very valuable. I guess I grew up in that blogger world where you need to have your own home on the internet that is not on someone else's platform. And I find it really helpful to, no matter what happens with Instagram, I'm not on TikTok, or I am, but I'm very bad at it. And on Twitter, I'm very just random. It is nice to have a place that I have control over, which in this day and age, we don't really have much control over anything. So it is, take your time with it. I don't think you need to be perfect at every single platform, but to Snigda's point, make one your beachhead, but also make sure you're driving people to your own property the way the juggernaut does with driving people back to the juggernaut to read the article with five smart reads. It's if you don't want to be on social media as much, here's a way that you can consume the same content in a more on your terms format. And I think that also respects people's time as well. Apartna, talk to us about the magical land of TikTok. <laughs> Y'all, I'm old. And when 2020 came about and the show was first coming out, season one, I was like, I went on, no, I didn't even go on. I didn't even start an account on TikTok. I knew that TikTok was about young kids dancing. And I was like, well, I don't dance. I'm not going to do it. I didn't even log on. When season two came around, I was like, okay, I feel pretty good. I, you know, it's been a year and a half since, you know, the other scene came out or two years at that point. I was like, I feel like I'm good with Instagram. Let me try it. So this is a little, you know, ch we're changing platforms. So I got an Instagram, I mean, I got a TikTok account. I made it the same name as my Instagram so that people could like connect the two. And I knew the show was what they were talking about. And so I watched TikToks for about an hour. And I was like, okay, what are, what are the kids doing? You know, what are they doing? Well, what they were doing was like talking to the camera very authentically and raw with like their rooms messy behind them or you know, in like doing their nighttime skin routines, no makeup on, like they're not changing their outfit for you. It was very like non-curated. So I was like, okay. So I went to the bathroom, I took off all my makeup, I put on this raggedy gray t-shirt and I just started talking to the camera. And it was about Indian matchmaking. I hashtagged it the way I saw the kids doing it. I was like, this FYP needs to know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the show. Got like 900,000 views. And I was like, wait a second. And I was like, huh. So then the next morning in my pajamas, I was like, I'm going to do two videos right now. So then I did. to be 400,000 views. I'm like, okay, okay. The kids like no makeup. So then I was like, I'm going to talk in the car. They do that sometimes. So what are, you, are you seeing what I'm doing? I'm like mimicking what is already successful on that platform. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm being very aware of the trend. And what's happening is that trends on TikTok are slowly coming to Instagram. So the ones that did really well on TikTok, which can be three minutes, and if I kept them under a minute, I could put them on Instagram. It was scary for me. Instagram is not a place for no makeup and t-shirts. It's like not it. Like still today, it's not it. But I was like, you know, people, like I said, five, six million people are viewing my page. They're not going to follow me, but let me give them what they want. What am I doing? I'm figuring out the trend of the platform and then also the viewers at that time. Not just my followers, but the viewers. So I say like, try it, see what, you, you know, see what works on another platform. You may have to change your style, but just view the platform, use it as like analysis. Like what is doing super well? Like on Instagram for a while and in TikTok, it was like simple audios. Like you could just like be walking down the street with an audio playing behind you and people liked it. That's gone now, but you have to be kind of aware of the trends. And I'm not saying spend your life watching social media so you can figure it out, but say, hey, new platform, haven't been on in a few months, what's going on here? 
watch for an hour, half an hour. So like, I don't love TikTok. So I got like up to, I don't know, nothing even big, 25, 26,000, you know, in that week or two after the show. And then I paused. I put up videos occasionally to get, you know, my same followers there. Season three is about to come out. I'm not even on it, but I'm like, oh, I'm ready. I'm going to get the next 25,000 followers on this. So watch those peaks. And, you know, really give time during those short periods and you'll see growth. And if you don't want to give it time in between, don't. I don't give TikTok time. I don't scroll on it. I don't get on it. And I don't care. But I will grow when season three comes out. I'm not on season three. doesn't matter. I think a key takeaway to extract from these messages is people love to consume relatable, authentic content. But what does that mean, Right. Abarno, you were saying like you like that is it's like trending to do things like take a video while you're in your pajamas or like while you're in the car. It's real life. It's just real life. Hitha, in your newsletter, you talk all the time about you know being a mom and uh, Taco Bell and of course the Eagles and Snigla, you love Bollywood. Like you know, it's it, it, you don't have to. I think two things here. One, you don't have to box yourself into one thing and stick with that forever. Um, we are all multi-hyphenate, whether we say that or not, and multi-passionate. And with that, when you think about how you show up in the world or share and help people solve problems, it's the same thing, right? People love to see just someone who looks like them, who sounds like them. Um, and I think that's like one of the greatest compliments and kind of pieces of feedback I get is if my content is relatable. And I like to draw upon personally when I share more so on LinkedIn and Twitter these days, stuff that I face challenges with or that I used to face challenges with in my career. Things like how to negotiate a salary, um, especially when it comes to all of the pay equity um, issues that we see in tech and across almost every industry. Um, simple tips of like, you know, I, I remember I created a post that was about don't go into a negotiation with your number and state your number that you want. Go in and ask what the range is before you talk about what you want. Um, and it's like, it was a lot of content that I thought was common knowledge, actually, that I found started to resonate a lot um, with other women and um was originally my intent was women in tech and realize it is broadly ap ap applicable across business and media and 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 tech and um on twitter also it's so different than like tiktok and instagram because there's no visuals it's just your words and i kind of like that a lot um because you have to be not only super concise but deliver value in that conciseness when you share and one of my most like mini viral tweets that I had was like this very simple thread about here are my four tips for how I manage my time and get shit done as a remote product leader at the world's biggest breaking news organization with no apps. And it was a very simple thread and I actually was in a writing program at that time and I couldn't think of a topic to write about halfway through and I threw this together and turned it into a thread. And it went all over the place and got picked up by a bunch of outlets and, I mean, it amassed many followers and all that good stuff. But I realized then that it doesn't need to be complex either. Um, when people find something that's relatable, it's usually in the simple. And, you know, that's why sitting in your car or in your pajamas is relatable because it's simple. Um, you're on the same level as your audience. You're talking with them instead of at them. Um, and the, even the way that I started to pose my in, uh, problems and challenges is I always say we um, instead of you or I. Um, this is how we overcome this. This is how we can solve this problem, especially when I'm talking about something collective to like women in tech or, you know, women of color in tech who face, you know, uh, discrimination or pay, um, pay discrepancy or, you know, negotiation issues, um, the wealth gap, any of that. And I think just that part in itself, I know, is very, very hard for people, right? And it was hard for all of us at one point too to just show up. Um, but one of the key takeaways here too is once you start, you start to get a lot of amazing feedback. And that feedback 
will help you figure out what's working and what's not. And you will fail. F failure gives you feedback. And sometimes things will click and sometimes they won't. These things happen over years um, of work, not days, not months, not weeks. Um, and one thing that was interesting about our journeys, even though they're overlapping but very unique, is we did all realize at one point that we needed more. We needed more for ourselves. And we had to create that for ourselves and offer that also that we have more to offer the world than just our nine to five or just what was expected of us. Um, maybe you know, it was law or business or science or tech. Um, and again, some of us pivoted and some of us integrated and expanded. But in this day and age, um, it is incredible the power that social media has to build positive sum networks and meaningful connections and build brands that can actually change the world, whether it's personal or professional. Um, on that note, since we have just a few minutes left, that was my main takeaway and what I'm excited about is just kind of seeing what unfolds at this point um, and sharing content that just serves the audience and answering questions that help people solve problems. Um, Snigda, what about you? Yeah. Um, my main takeaway, my last takeaway is um, this is sometimes difficult to do when you're running ops or brand building for a company. But just remember about the energy that gives you joy because every your audience will understand the energy that's coming through any communications coming from your brand. Whether it's a PR release, a tweet, an Instagram, if there's joy in there, they will see that joy and they will respond and it'll be amazing. If it's fear or anxiety, they will feel that. It's weird. It's like people feel your energy through the interwebs. And so my big takeaway and my big advice to anybody who's just starting or still in the middle of it or scaling or, you know, all the way really grown and maintaining, you know, find the joy in what you're doing with your brand because it will really, really show. And if you don't think there's joy in your brand, go look to other brands that are doing it and that you really admire. Find a few things that you'd like to be known for and make it happen, but it's not going to happen otherwise. So make sure you're having fun. That's like my big key takeaway. Mine is to not over um, look curation over just creation. Sometimes when you want to build a brand on social media, you feel the pressure to have to create at a level that if you're comparing yourself to people who have been doing this for a very long time, it could seem really intimidating. Curation is just as important of a skill and can offer so much more value at a much more approachable entry point. So if you are just getting started on building out a personal brand, consider what it is you really love, to speak to Snigda's point, and curate that. For me, it's news and books, especially romance novels or random things about the Philadelphia Eagles or Taco Bell news. So, and don't feel like you need to box yourself in. You could pick a theme that you also have a lot of interest in and play around with the specifics under it to find what your niche is. It'll be the one that brings you the most joy and the one that gets the most engagement because that community that you're building feels the joy. Uh, for me, it goes back to what I always say, serve your audience. Like, I really do think of it as building my brand, and it is work. And sure, there's joy and fun in it, but I serve my audience. If they want to see something and I see them responding to a certain thing, maybe I don't love it. Maybe I don't love chatting to the camera with no makeup on, but they wanted it, and I gave it to them. And then they realize that like they're here for the other content, or they have the choice to unfollow. But I'm always watching. What are they loving? What are they not? Because I can show up in you know my ten different hats, but if they only like really love three of them, sure, I'll focus on those three. Like. For me, it's just important to be constantly watching and, and assessing. And you'll see that as social media evolves, your brand will evolve to kind of fit that niche that's happening. You know, like I was talking about on TikTok, the patterns that we see there. And um, those will help you build your community. And it doesn't feel inauthentic. Some people are like, well, that's very calculated. I'm like, is it or is it responding to my audience and their needs? So serve your audience. Amazing. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending. We've got time for a couple questions, maybe one. Um, I think there's, I, we can't see any. I can, does anybody have questions? If you do, you can just stand up and yell them out. <laughs> no questions, we've answered every single question.
Wow. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. One question. Wait a second. One second. Yeah, one question. Brown building? We're also building brown. We're also building brown. I think we need another panel for that. <laughs> but the quick answer is that I think that every single industry we are in, we are often like a rare small percentage. So whether it's product management, being a female founder, running a pharmaceutical company, like literally being a breakout star of a reality show and then turning it into your own brand. Um, yeah, I think we just have to work 10x harder. I don't know what else to say. We, we've all become very good friends, but we, they, we have been in rooms where it was the first time there have been that many brown women who were the first to do something that they did. And we made a commitment in those rooms that we wouldn't be the last. So we are really also focused on not just building our brands, but showing up and supporting each other's because we know how lonely it was when we first got started and we don't want it to be the same for the people who come after us. Even for this panel, I, I'm glad you made stated that comment. Thank you so much because this is not a DEI panel. We just wanted to come and share our tips and tricks and what has worked for us and what hasn't. We just happen to be four brown women doing different things that have worked for us. So thank you. I think there's another question back there. Yes. We can take it. Netflix did not come to me. Her question was, uh, now I have a lot of inbound, but what did I do before it? Netflix did not come to me. Chapter one of my book talks about how I applied for this show. It's like the first few pages. But basically, I'd been on a bad day in LA, was leaving early on a standby flight, turned on Facebook, and there was um, a, a post from someone, hey, my sister is a casting director. Um, are you single? Are you South Asian? Are you looking for your spouse? And I was like, yep, just left the worst date ever. And I signed up right then and there in five minutes got on that plane, forgot all about it. I got a call when I landed and they were like, hey, we got your application. I was also applying for car loans at the time. So I was like, what credit union are you with? And they were like, Netflix, wait, what? <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh yeah, the matchmaking show. And so that's how it happened. So my big takeaway from that was your life can change in the decisions you make in five minutes. So um, keep making them. I think that, you know, I'm a very quick decision maker. If I had hummed and hawed over that, I would have forgotten it, lost the post, you know, but I quickly moved. Maybe I'll regret it one day, but I'm still going strong. <laughs> yes. Thank you for that question. Hi, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question was, what if you've been a brand for a really long time and you now want to pivot and go into a new mode of creation? So I think when I think about this, you know what's funny is that even when you are not an old brand and a new brand, you kind of go through the same process, which is one of the things that going back to energy and joy, I also watch brands that give me a lot of joy. So one of my favorite brands to follow was this one called The Cut. They're awesome. They're hilarious on Instagram and they take news and they make it really funny and really scandalous. So what I would say is when you go, oh, we have to wrap it up. Okay. So what I would say is like, look out for the brands that you like, come up with three words that you want it to be, and then just try testing out this new persona. It's like wearing a new coat and see if it works. It might. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you.